morning and welcome. I'm Brian Schiffman, President and CEO of the Vaughn Chamber of Commerce. We're pleased that you've been able to join us for another installment of the Vaughn Chamber's Business Resource Series. In this series, we featured speakers from all sectors, accountants, chief economists, employment lawyers, anxiety experts. Our goal is to help our business community navigate the pandemic, including understanding the many government programs available and how to access them and the reopening guidelines. In fact, as many of you know, the Vaughn Chamber, on the Vaughn Chamber website, we have real-time information on business resources from government, tips from business professionals, and a PPE supplier guide featuring local businesses. We also have programs that can save your business money at this time and help you buy and sell locally like our Vaughn Chamber Facebook Marketplace and Get in the Loop Mobile Marketing, among other programs. Today's session, sponsored by CN and presented in partnership with both the City of Vaughan's Economic and Cultural Development Department and Render Media, which provides live webcasting support, comes at the ideal time. We just heard earlier this week from TD's Deputy Chief Economist on his financial and economic outlook, given all the disruption that COVID has caused. And today, I'll talk with CN about the impact the pandemic has had on Canada's supply chain and the movement of we especially wanted to hold today's session because we see CN's results as a bellwether of the health of Canada's supply chain, given Canada's heavy reliance on exports. After all, CN is a leading North American transportation and logistics company, the only transcontinental railway in North America spanning Canada and Mid-America connecting three coasts, and handles over $250 billion worth of goods and approximately 20% of Canada's exports. I'm joined by the perfect person to help explain all this, Fiona Murray, Vice President, Public and Government Affairs at CN. Fiona leads the company's stakeholder engagement initiatives through her North American responsibility for CN's relationships with governments at all levels, as well as media relations, sponsorships and donations, community relations, and corporate communications. Fiona, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and um, you know, good morning to all uh, all your members, uh, the members of the Vaughn Chamber, and uh, to any other uh, folks uh, who are who are listening in. I'm I'm really delighted to be here today. We're we're delighted too, and I'll just, I'll just say to our viewers watching from home, watching from their offices, uh, there will be time for Q and A, uh, moderated by myself throughout the presentation and later in the segment, as we always do. So please do keep your questions coming in the chat box. Uh, they will be filtered to me. And a quick shout out to uh, Daniel Salvatore at CN, who I know works for you, Fiona, for helping make this happen. Uh, you've both been fabulous to work with, uh, longtime champions of the Vaughn Chamber. And uh, Fiona, back to you and uh, look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you, uh, Brian. And uh, also thank you to Dan. Uh, he's, a, he's a great team member. Um, also, thank you to Jennifer and uh, Abdus, who uh, um, are producing this session I'm sure it's not. I know it's not your full time, your your first time doing it. But I bet uh, you didn't think three months ago you'd be you'd be sort of speaking to people across screens. So really well done, very professional. And, and thank you very much. Yeah, it's a you. it's a very different experience now, but it Absolutely. it feels like we're together. So that's yeah, good. yeah, I do. Um, so again, hello, Vaughn, and um, uh, I don't know if you know, but you are home to CN's uh, largest rail yard on our network. The McMillan Yard is in Vaughn. Uh, it's our largest and busiest uh, uh, yard on the network. Um, sometimes we are a bit of a, a, a noisy, uh, a noisy neighbor. So I'll start right out by saying uh, we apologize for that. But that is the sound of uh, Canada's economy. Um, also, uh, your neighbors over in Brampton, uh, the Brampton Intermodal Yard, uh, our largest intermodal uh, terminal, and a very important part of bringing goods to uh, to the Greater Toronto Area and into other parts of Canada. Um, Ontario is also very important to, uh, to CN. We have about 4,000 employees uh, in Ontario and uh, over 2,500 uh, miles of track. So uh, an important part of our network and um, you know, it's, it's uh, places where you find lots of, uh, lots of different CN uh, facilities and, um, and infrastructure. Uh, and the chamber network, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about that. I am on the, uh, the board of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. So I have a very, uh, good, good uh, understanding of the importance of chambers and that whole network and how uh, business people come together across this country to, to make Canada work. So um, deep, deep respect for chambers and uh, thank you very much to the, uh, the Vaughan Chamber of Commerce, your, your good partner to CN. 
Um, you know, we're Partners in Prosperity for Canada, and uh, I can't think of a better group really to speak to about uh, the steps that we're taking to serve our customers and to keep the supply chain moving uh, during these pretty unprecedented and, and challenging times. Um, they're not easy times, but there are silver linings, and I don't want it to be a doom and gloom uh, story today. Um, I even made the title of, of the presentation uh, uh, such that you would see that there's light, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, mm -hmm literally speaking, when you come to talk about CN. So don't give up. Um, you know, there's lots of, lots of reasons for us to, to, keep, uh, to keep the faith and um, to continue, continue to come together in these types of places to talk about, um, talk about how we can, we can get together as Canadians and, and really make the, um, the, the economy uh, recover as soon as possible. So with that, um, if we could go to my presentation and uh, I'll take you through this, hopefully it'll take about 15, 20 minutes and then uh, we'll have some Q and A's after Brian. Sounds great. Thank you. Sounds great. So I'm not seeing slides, but if that's, uh, if that's something I should be waiting for, just. Yeah, the, sli the slides, are, we don't see them, but the slides are up. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So hopefully you're on my, uh, you're, you're on my uh, first page, uh, powering through today, today's change and uncertainty. And um, that, is, it's, that is essentially what CN has been doing since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, we'll flip through the next two slides. They're, um, they're forward-looking statement uh, um, and non-gap um, fine print, but really just you know, any forward-looking statement should be viewed through the, the lens that the pandemic has really thrown markets that we depend on into disarray and uncertainty. And um, therefore, CN did withdraw our um, 2020 key assumptions and guidance from our that we put out in 2019 year-end release. Um, so those have been withdrawn, um, but I'm going to show you why uh, that is... Uh, you know, um, what we have to do because we're publicly traded, but it's not because we don't know uh, that there's good things coming. So next slide, please. So just to set the table for those who might be slightly less familiar with, uh, with railways, um, North America is blessed with, with a massive uh, freight railway system, uh, the best in the world and enviable uh, um, interconnections. Um, you know, there's seven class one railroads and hundreds of short lines um, in North America. It's really the backbone of the North American economy, and it enables uh, trade um, over the 500 million uh, people that, that uh, call North America home and um, the 24.3 trillion in, uh, in GDP. So connected into uh, every corner of, of the continent. Um, across the industry, there is a uh, unwavering commitment to, uh, to safety as a core value. Um, you know, more than 99.99999% of, of, uh, of hazmats move, uh, sort of dangerous goods move uh, without incident. And um, on the very, very rare occasion that there is an incident, there's an extremely robust system for dealing with that. Um, the industry has also put billions into positive train control and infrastructure improvements over the last few years. So the industry has never been this safe. Um, you know, we're also a, a, an essential service provider. So I think sometimes um, the public don't always realize where the goods uh, that they buy and consume come from. Um, it's, a, it's a global world and it's not always obvious, but I can, uh, I can pretty much be confident that anything that you are seeing, touching, sitting on, wearing, eating in your daily lives has been touched by, by the rail industry. Um, it may turn up on your, your store shelves because of a truck, but uh, up in the, you know, further up the supply chain, it was definitely uh, part of one of the, the, the many carloads and, and containers that CN moves. Um, and also, you know, we, we play a big role in the sustainability efforts. Um, it's, uh, you know, unquestionable un, un, uh, that moving, uh, uh, you know, freight by rail is a greenhouse gas reducer. Uh, a freight train on average moves one ton of freight um, more than 470 miles on a gallon of fuel. So that kind of uh, fuel efficiency is just um, um, playing into the greenhouse gas reduction for North America. So on that map, you'll see the red line. That is CN, uh, an enviable footprint. And um, 
you know, we call it the big, the big T or the big Y, and it goes from coast to coast to coast. So from the West Coast in Canada, the East Coast in Canada, right down through the Midwest and the center of the United States to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is just sort of a, a reminder of, of the major contributor that CN is to uh, the North American economy. And um, we're a little lighter than 25,000 employees at the moment due to the, the state of the economy, but uh, you know that number will climb back up again. Uh, 15 billion in, in annual revenues. Um, you know, we invest heavily every year, about 20% of our annual revenues. Last year it was 3.9 billion. We'll talk a little bit later about what we're doing this year. Uh, we have a, almost 20,000 route miles that we're responsible for. And, um, you know, 78 billion market cap used to get us to about fifth on the list, fourth, fifth on the list. Um, I think some of the, uh, the online shopping, uh, shopping companies uh, pulled ahead of, of banks and railroads. But um, my guess is that might, uh, that might even out over time. You, and, guys you, will, know, you guys will be there for the long term. We know what we, we, we hope so. Shopify <laughs> leading that right now. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, 5.9 million car loads uh, moved a year. So, you know, there's at any one point, uh, there's, you know, millions of cars moving around North America loaded with goods and, and, and uh, products. So if we go to the next slide, I just give you peel the onion a little bit and, and give you a sense of what's inside those cars and containers. So again, there's that big Y, uh, the big T across North America. Um, we have a highly diversified portfolio at CN. It's one of the things that, that uh, actually um, is unique to CN is that we're not reliant on any one sector um, more than 25% of our, of our revenues. And it means that when one is yinging and the other is yanging that we actually do okay. These are kind of unusual times, but uh, we've, been through, uh, we've been through recessions before and this type of diversity actually protects us. Um, so you'll see intermodal at 25%. That's, uh, that's anything that turns up in a container on our rail line. Um, petroleum and chemicals uh, at 20%, uh, the grains and fertilizers, 16%, forest products, 12%, and metals and minerals at 11%. Automotive, a smaller sector for us, 6%. And coal only five percent. Uh, quite unusual in in the rail industry that coal is such a small part of our um, our revenue streams. Um, it we love to move it, but it's just not a, a large component, and it's actually protected us from some of the down downturn that we've seen in the U.S. Uh, railroads. You'll also see on the map that there's thicker lines and thinner lines. Um, you'll see that uh, you know traffic doesn't move at an equal uh, density across our network. And Western Canada, sort of Chicago through Winnipeg and out through to the West Coast, or vice versa, West Coast in through across the continent, um, is much uh, much denser on our network than what you'll see in Eastern Canada or down in the, the Southern US. Um, so we've got lots of, lots of capacity in the East, lots of capacity in, in uh, the South. And because of a lot of our, uh, our, our recent capital investments, we have um, more capacity in the West than, than what we used to. You'll also see that um, transborder is 34% of our, uh, our revenues. We are a net originating railroad, which means that most of what we move starts, starts with us and goes on to another railroad or, or to destination. Um, that comes with a lot of challenges, uh, which are good to have, but uh, makes us again, a little bit different than some of the, the US railroads. Um, you'll see that 26% uh, of, of um, traffic moving out uh, or into the West Coast. Again, a very, very busy part of our network, a critical part of our network. And we'll talk a little bit later about why, why people in, uh, in Vaughan and Greater uh, Toronto should, should care about what happens on the West Coast. So if we can just go to the next slide. And I ask actually, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we can go to the next slide, but I thought, uh, especially for those, as an example, uh, we have so many friends and colleagues through the chamber who are just big fans of the rail industry. And, and, and I think there is, uh, some uh, there's a lot of interest, but some lack of knowledge. For instance, which goods go through which sites, uh, and and you you referenced earlier how most of the things you're wearing or you're sitting at a table are coming through a rail. So can you talk to me about the Mackyard site and uh, the Brampton site because the closest to Vaughan, and just talk about what kind of goods might be going through there that we we all depend on. Right. So Mackyard is is really a carload operation. So when we when you see a train with boxcars and um, you know lumber cars or 
uh, hopper cars on it. That's the type of <clears throat> traffic that ends up in backyard. So a lot of inputs into industry, you'll see, you know, plastic pellets coming in to be formed into water bottles. You'll see um, propane coming in to be used in uh, the barbecues in your backyard. Um, you might see uh, water treatment chemicals coming in for your swimming pool. So a lot of, of inputs into industry that are either in their raw form or their semi-finished form that are going into manufacturing in uh, the Toronto area to be turned into products that people consume. Um, in Brampton, a lot of what's coming in is already uh, consumer goods. So, you know, the iPads, the running shoes, the, uh, the suit you're wearing that, that was made in, uh, in, in, in Taiwan, um, a lot of consumer goods coming in in, in, in containerized traffic. So uh, those shipping containers you see, and then it gets uh, unloaded in Brampton, put on a truck and normally driven to a large depot or warehouse that will then feed it out into the retail sector. Um, I like to use the example of a bicycle. Um, there's, there's only a few uh, bicycle manufacturers in the world. Most of them are in Korea. And uh, you know they will make bicycles of all shapes and sizes and qualities and colors and ship them over in containers. And these are the bicycles that end up in your Canadian tires and your Home Depots and your Toys R Us. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a lifeblood of, of Canadians backyard fun that, that comes into Brampton. And the, and these days because of COVID, all those products, bikes, trampolines, nobody can get any of them. So let's ship some more. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about, yeah. about the disruption to the supply chains and, um, and where those bikes and trampolines are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, so on the next slide, we had, um, uh, so I've still got the map up, hopefully. Um, just a little bit of uh, discussion about the border, because there's been a lot of talk about how COVID-19 has interrupted the flow across the Canada-US border. Um, fortunately for CN, uh, you know, governments very early on uh, acknowledged our status as an essential service provider. And one of the things that uh, we were very quick to do when we, we were um, aware of what this pandemic was going to be like was to make sure that we contacted border, border authorities. We have very good relationships with them. We deal with them every day and um, impressed upon them the importance of keeping that border open. Um, fortunately, uh, you know, we have some pretty high tech uh, security that, that looks inside every single rail car. It's like an x-ray machine. Uh, we have a lot of good communications with border authorities. They get uh, manifests of what's on our trains well in advance of, of us turning up. And I'm happy to say that the border for us has been a complete non-event. Um, there's one guy at CN who's been responsible for reporting on border operations every day, and he's kind of the Maytag repair guy. Um, he's he just had nothing to write except border is fluid, border is fluid. So um, great news, and um, you know it's it's one of the things that uh, that um, maybe as consumers we we think about uh, you know the, the, the limits that we, that we can't travel across the border. But there's also people that need to travel across the border, um, not just inside our train, inside of the cab of our locomotive, but also to go and fix rail, to inspect rail, to be part of uh, you know, a, a work uh, gang. So we've had fabulous cooperation from, from the border authorities. And, and um, you know, it, it just goes to show how, uh, how everybody pulls together during difficult times. If we go to the next slide, I'll just maybe talk a little bit about um, what we have done during the COVID-19 pandemic to protect our employees and the importance of that so that we can continue to be an essential service provider. Um, you know, our response to COVID was immediate. And, um, you know, we were looking at this back in January and February. We have a uh, occupational health service at CN with a, um, a doctor who runs it. She's part of um, the Rail Association, American Rail Association Occupational Health Committee. She's plugged into the uh, WHO um, and you know, very passionate about, uh, about safety and health. And immediately um, we moved to a point where we had a, a cross-functional cross pandemic team. She was at the lead with our um, chief of police and um, corporate security. And we took it very much as a uh, a team approach, but it was about um, res responsible behavior on the part of an essential service provider so that we could continue to, to, to play our role. 
Um, by March 9th, uh, we were well into phase one. So probably a few weeks out ahead of, of others. Um, by March 12th, we had 5,000 employees working at home. And those that do know CN know that, you know, we, we were never a work from home kind of culture. So to send 5,000 people uh, at home with laptops and screens and uh, working from screens like this was, was a challenge, but uh, we rolled out MS Teams in the space of seven days. And um, frankly, it, it, it's gone without a hitch. Um, you know, we worked with uh, government authorities and uh, probably 30 plus organizations to ensure that they understood that the 20,000 CNers that weren't working at home that are out in the field doing their job um, needed access to things like uh, hotels, you know, when our crews get off their, the locomotive at their destination, they need to be able to go into a hotel to rest. They need to be able to go to a grocery store to, to, to buy food, to feed themselves. Um, it was all this kind of chain reaction that we felt we needed to bring to the authorities' uh, attention so that they, although allowing us to be an essential service provider, they needed to allow all the small businesses and all the commerce that, that we rely on every day to, to do our jobs, that those would re also remain open. So a lot of uh, a lot of explanation of what we do, of supply chains, and and um, you know fairly uh, fairly brisk pace on the communications front. Um, we felt our responsibility to our customers and to the country to stay safe and healthy. So on May first, we implemented a mandatory face mask policy at CN. So all twenty five thousand employees, um, you know, whether you're out in the field uh, working on the tracks, you're inside a, a locomotive cab you're at the uh, rail traffic control center, or when I go outside of my office, uh, we all put our masks on and um, you know, we, we make a, a, a very concerted effort to keep each other safe. Um, we've, we've been cleaning uh, you know, every knob, every button, you know, every uh, inside locomotives, inside bunkhouses, uh, locker rooms, you name it. If you have to walk through a labyrinth to get into headquarters these days, uh, I think you've You've sanitized your hands twice before you even make it to the uh, the elevator. So um, you know we're doing everything we can to to, to continue to operate without um, an issue. It's a tiny, tiny fraction of our employee population that has been um, uh, found to be positive. When that happens, they're immediately sent home for 14 days. We walk in with a fogger. Maybe not we, but we hire people that walk in with the foggers and we disinfect the area. We send all the other employees home. We leave the area for 24 hours uh, to allow the, the fogging to do its job. And, and uh, we only bring people back when it's safe to do so. So it has been a huge and massive effort, but um, an essential one and one that uh, we're gonna continue to do as long as uh, the pandemic's with us. If we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll kind of walk us through some of the effects the pandemic has had on, uh, on our traffic volumes. And when I say traffic volumes, you always have to remember there's customers behind those volumes. So, um, you know, we can sort of bemoan the fact that our volumes are down, but the impact to the railway, uh, although quite significant, does not mirror the impact to many of our customers. And, you know, we recognize that every day there's people in much worse conditions and, and worse off than CN. And uh, we're doing our part to, to help them come back and recover. But, you know, it, it's been very difficult for some of our, our customers. Um, you'll see on the side of these slides uh, statistics that are from uh, the AAR, the American Association of Railroads. They're a little old and I apologize for that. I'd hoped to get them updated, but um, they weren't available. Um, but what it tells you is the story about, you know, 2018, doing pretty good. 2019, we're already starting to see things slow down a bit. I think people forget before COVID, there was actually a, a slowing of the economy. Um, and, you know, you can see that on the, you know, the comparison between the blue and red lines. And then the black line comes in and, you know, uh, it was already, you know, sort of a difficult uh, volume situation in, um, in particular in the United States. That's the effect of the coal. I told you there's a, you know, a larger percentage of coal moved by those railroads. Um, but Canadian railroads were feeling it too. Um, just maybe not as, as deeply. And then the plunge, the fall off the cliff uh, into, uh, into the pandemic. Um, I will tell you that, uh, you know, and you said it, Brian, that railroads are sort of the barometer of the, the economy. Um, we felt May was the bottom. 
uh, you know, we've seen we've seen fluttering and little green shoots and things picking up um, since maybe the, the last week of May and into June. And, um, you know, we're hopeful that that continues. Uh, it's a good sign. And, um, you know, there's uh, there's sectors that that really are still fairly flat to down. And then there's others like grain that have been moving gangbusters. Um, so I thought I was teasing one farmer that I talked to on a regular basis that it's uh, even farmers couldn't say bad things about the railroad during the pandemic. We, we've uh, really teamed up with farmers and, and there's great demand for their, their produce um, to get grain to all of these countries that want to stockpile food for their people during a pandemic. So it's good pricing, good demand, and um, you know, a network that is wide open and plenty of capacity. So we're probably touch wood moving in on um, another record month, but we've had a record March, a record April, and a record May in terms of grain movements off the coast of uh, Canada. So if we move to the next slide, this is more about the containerized traffic and a little bit different dynamics. Um, again, you'll see that you know 2019 in the U.S. was was uh, starting to show signs of uh, of slowing down. Um, Canada. It was sort of more towards the end of uh, end of 2019 that it started to hit us, and then, you know, we we again get hit by the pandemic, but then a little bit of an uptick. So certainly not back to where uh, where we'd like it to be, but um, it's uh, you know it's kind of an interesting situation. We watched a lot of this because we have offices in Asia, so we watched a lot of this through the eyes of our our Asian colleagues in um, in China and um, Vietnam and. Um, uh, Korea, and you know, so we were sort of seeing what was coming our way. A lot of a lot of this uh, container vessels were canceled, so the number of vessels calling on uh, North America decreased because people were sent home and factories closed. Exactly what we're living now: uh, production of of goods dropped off, and um, you know, those containers that would usually arrive on the coast just weren't coming in. Um, Fast forward to Asia reopening and the pandemic was sweeping through North America. Demand for some goods uh, was, was uh, curtailed. Everybody was told to, to shut their retail operations. And um, a lot of those containers full with bicycles and running shoes and <laughs> iPads that I was talking about got caught in transit. And we had an enormous amount of containerized goods, you know, sort of on the railroad with nobody to receive them. So there was a, a lot of very good work done by my intermodal colleagues to find places to store those containers, put them away for when uh, you know, the retail industry would, would open back up again. Um, but as everybody knows, they're now uh, loaded with goods that, that you know, are people, the people need. Um, you know, there might have been six weeks of pre-shipping pre so that the things that you would have bought in the spring have already been delivered. The things that you would buy in the summer didn't make it. And, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what turns up on shelves. I was teasing someone that, you know, we'll be buying snow shovels in, in, uh, in July and, and bicycles in, in uh, December. So things will have and to start balancing out. To put that in perspective, though, like how unprecedented is that to have um, so much uh, freight that ends up on the tracks where you have to go out of your way to find a place to store it? Is that, has that unprecededented? Ever Absolutely. Unprecedented. Yeah. You know, we've, we've had our challenges this year and, uh, you know, we won't relive it, but you know, the <laughs> blockades, 22 days of blockades weren't easy. We had a labor uh, disruption the previous uh, November, um, nothing compared to that. So this, you know, we had, uh, you know, triple stack containers of, of goods that needed to either be stored somewhere or um, if they were essential, because there were goods in amongst those containers that were essential, they had to be picked out and you know identified, wow. picked out from a stack of containers and and delivered to uh, the places that uh, were were calling for them. So you know a lot of uh, a lot of you know sort of essential um, service going on from our uh, our intermodal side of the house for mm -hmm. sure. Um, the good news is, again, we think May was the bottom and uh, June is looking healthier. We're seeing um, more vessels calling on uh, on North America now and, and into Vancouver and Prince Rupert. Um, the amount of containers coming off those vessels is higher, and therefore the number of trains that we're, we're, we're loading up and moving from the West Coast um, is, is, is uh, greater than it was. So if we go to the next uh, slide, I'll just, uh, and I hope I'm not uh, going on too long here, I don't want to 
No, I think it's okay because we're we're talking throughout. So. Okay, good, right. good. Yeah. You'll you'll tell me. Give me the give me the hook if you need to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we, uh, you know, just in terms of what CN's done to to uh, to react to the overall demand, um, you know, we have right sized our our operation, um, just like any you know company with high fixed costs. You've you've got to do what you can. Um, you know, we've had about at, at peak there were about twenty thousand rail cars in storage. We're down to sixteen thousand. Uh, the automotive industry opened up, uh, which is great. So, you know, about 4,000 uh, auto racks came out. Um, we've got over 600 locomotives in storage. Um, these are, you know, CN's fleet. So they're not, uh, they're not going back to the, to the locomotive uh, leases. They're, they're waiting for the, the, the recovery. Um, and unfortunately, we had to furlough about, um, about, about 3,500 of our employees. Um, so on temporary layoff, um, never an easy thing to do, never fun to send a colleague home, but waiting for the recovery so that we can call them back and um, start moving, moving Canada's economy again. Um, you know, we're uh, making use of this time of, of a less busy network to get our engineering crews out on the network, building all that track that I was talking about and um, making sure that we've, uh, we've got uh, the capacity um, in place by the time the recovery comes. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll just, you know, maybe quickly talk about, um, you know, and, and maybe we skip this just in the, the, the uh, you know, just, just to go to the next slide. So investing to support our business. I'll just talk about that because I think it's important that, you know, um, CN is continuing to invest. We always invest about 20% of our annual um, revenues back into the network. Um, over the last 10 years, we spent about 25 billion on our network. Um, and this is, this is building new track, uh, twinning existing track, uh, all those locomotives I talked to you about. So we brought in 200 new locomotives over the last few years and some um, new rail cars. So we're, we're continuing to invest in, uh, in, in uh, 2020. Um, I think we're probably one of the only companies that is coming out with the CapEx uh, messaging. Um, so of the 2.9 billion, about 310 million will be spent in Ontario. Um, you know, we're going to be putting in new, about 60 miles of new rail, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand new rail ties, fixing some of the crossings, the bridges, and um, obviously, uh, you know, making sure that we have a, a, a safe uh, network. Um, if you go to the next slide, some of that 2.9 billion is being spent in Vancouver. Um, and, you know, this is, this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing project, but an important one, an important one, not necessarily for the people of Vancouver, although they also benefit, but for all of Canada. And talking about those goods coming in and that, that you know, container full of bicycles and iPads, um, you know, this is where it all happens it's at the waterfront. So that de-bottlenecking of the waterfront is underway. You know, so over a billion in private sector money being spent. Um, so our customers building, there's, uh, you know, 400 million being spent by CN in conjunction with the Port of Vancouver and the federal government. And it's really to, to uh, address several pinch points that have been uh, an irritant when the economy is booming. So our guys are out doing uh, everything to get uh, these in place before the end of the year. And a little bit of a silver lining of COVID-19 is that they're out there pretty much uninterrupted um, and they can do their work much more quickly and efficiently than they used to. Just go to the next slide, same story up in Prince Rupert. So again, some, some critical infrastructure that's being put in place. Uh, Prince Rupert is um, you know, it's sort of the, the, the little, little port that could, that is now, uh, is now growing to a not so little port anymore. So a billion in private and federal government money going in and 350 million um, going in uh, on a joint venture with the CN report and the feds too, to uh, increase the, the capacity across bridges and what have you. So why am I telling people in Vaughan about what's happening on that West Coast? Um, that's because, as we've said, most of what you consume is coming into Canada from Asia through those two gateways. And what we build out on the West Coast to de-bottleneck and to address pinch points needs to be matched in, inside Canada. So um, if you go to the next slide, I'm sure many on, on the call here today have, have heard about our Milton Logistics project. Um, I think many of you have been very supportive, so thank you for that. And really the purpose of this terminal is to receive those goods that are coming in from Vancouver and Prince Rupert. Um, 
you know, it, it's the heart of, uh, of Canada in terms of distribution and retail and manufacturing. And you cannot, you cannot build up the West Coast and not uh, match it with capacity and infrastructure on the inside of, of Canada. So very simply, um, that's where the trains are going to come in, unload those goods, they get on trucks, and they go out to the, uh, to the Home Depots and the, the Canadian Tires and um, in some cases, even your grocery stores. Um, if we go to the next slide, this kind of makes the, the point where you'll see, you know, it is a global, it is a global supply chain. Um, it's, it's a nationally significant uh, project. And we believe, if you go to the next slide, that it's, it's actually going to uh, be a recovery uh, enabler. So it's shovel ready. Um, it's, it's been proven to be needed. Uh, I think, uh, you know, COVID-19 will, will uh, mark a, a low point in terms of traffic volumes, but in order for this, con this country to recover and come back, one, you need people to be investing, to get jobs so that people can go out and buy those iPads and those bicycles. And also you need the infrastructure to support that. And that's what this project uh, brings. Um, also, I'll note that it's uh, privately funded, no, no, uh, no government money in there. And um, it's, uh, it's really a, a project that's important to the fabric of Canada in terms of getting us back on our feet. Um, everyone on the phone, I'm sure, uh, small businesses and larger businesses appreciate that somebody's got to, you know, kind of kickstart the, the, uh, the economy. I'm not suggesting CN doing it alone, but this will go a long way to, uh, to helping that happen. Um, I just say I think that I mean the Vaughn Chamber has been very active on that file, as you know, and uh, yes. definitely I, I think you answered it perfectly because for those watching now, and actually I've had a few text messages from people saying this is great, and others saying how do I get on because they couldn't see the beginning, and I said it's available. You'll be able to see this later on YouTube. Absolutely, think, yeah, yeah. It's a very important project, and you're right; it will create uh, significant jobs. Um, can you just, for those who don't know the background, can you go in again and just talk about uh, why that infrastructure is needed relevant, uh, relative to the other sites you already have in the GTA? Right. So, um, you know, we're, we're pretty much sold out at Brampton. You know, we're bursting at the seams. Um, you know, when I, I've got 28 years at CN. When I first joined CN, we were, you know, we were a six billion, uh, well, before, I mean, it was actually Crown Corporation, but after we privatized, you know, sort of a six billion annual um, revenue company. Uh, I remember when we made it to ten billion, and I mean, we were we were like high fiving in the boardroom. I mean, it was just you know we couldn't believe it. Well, we were almost fifteen billion last year, so you know the real estate and the footprint that that we've lived on for the last twenty five uh, years of, of of being a privately tra a publicly traded company. Um, we're outgrowing it. The population of Canada is growing. The, the demands of people are growing. Um, the size of their homes, what they want to put in their homes has grown. So all of that has, has uh, necessita necessitated the reason for us uh, needing to build a new intermodal hub. And it's, um, it, it will de-bottleneck a lot of the issues that, that you see in the Brampton area. So Again, um, you know, it moves from, from rail to truck. So most people in Toronto and Brampton and Vaughan are seeing the, the, the end result of that supply chain. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's sometimes hard to, to fathom how much we are reliant on, on rail to bring in the goods that we use on an everyday basis. So that's it for me. I, I you know, I, all I can say is, um, you know, we're all living through something that we've never lived through before. It's, it's, you know, it's had its, uh, it's had its challenges for sure. Um, being in Ontario and, and me in Quebec, we've probably seen the worst of it. Um, there's been some, some really tragic stories, uh, but you can't control that change in uncertainty. And I, I tell this to my team, you can only really control how you, how you react to it. And, uh, you know, at CN, we're, we're reacting in a way that, that we know best how to do to stay safe, to keep moving goods, to help our customers, to stay focused on, on our role as an essential service provider. Um, and we're gonna keep powering through that. So, you know, we can all help by, by continuing to stay six feet from each other, wear your masks, wash your hands. The faster we get out of this, the better it is for everybody. And uh, just a little plug to local businesses. And, and uh, so 
some of the best ways that you as a, as a citizen can help Canada and help the economy is get out and shop locally. Help those businesses that are closed and are trying to open. Um, consumerism is not a dirty word. Um, you know, it, it's, how, it's how people make their living. And we've got to, uh, you know, stay safe and healthy while we do it. But get back out and go shopping. Oh, thank you. That's, no, that's great. It's a good message. Um, I, I have so many questions for you. I just want to remind the audience uh, they can submit questions in the chat. Uh, I thought I'd, there's a lot of questions about supply chain specific to CN and broadly, but I wanted to start with a question when you referenced uh, early on, I think it was March 12th, and you were able to get 5,000 people working from home. Can you talk again about what that experience was like moving that quickly? Because a lot of our employment base, whether small or large, depending on the industry vertical, have struggled with this, um, enabling their people to work from home, setting up the infrastructure, and then now trying to get back to work safely and protect their customers and employees. So I think it's it's instructive in terms of, uh, yes, much bigger organization, but sometimes bigger is harder. How you were able so quickly to set up um, that number of people to work from home? Yeah, it was not easy. I mean, let's put it this way. It was easy to send people home and, and you know, we're sort of, top-down style culture. So, you know, when people are told to do something, they hop to it. So, you know, we basically said, look, you're going to have to work from home. And we all went home. Um, but actually being productive once you got there and, and you know, the loss of routine, I can say personally, as someone who, you know, would get on the train every morning at a certain time, sit in the same seat, speak to the same people, you know, do my email. By the, that loss of routine was, was quite um, disruptive. For, for people. So learning how to how to speak over the, use the technology for once to sort of speak over a screen. Not everybody is, is, is as comfortable jabbering away as I am. So, you know, that type of skill set, um, understanding how you're going to get things done without, uh, you know, collaborate and work in teams without being physically together. Um, for my team on the corporate communications side, we had 25,000 employees we had to communicate with. Uh, we went into overdrive. We've, we've made... Uh, more videos in the last 15 weeks than we have in the last uh, three years. Um, we, you know, we had posters up in uh, all the facilities across CN. Uh, you know, that's that's 20,000 miles of track. Um, there's little offices all over this country that we had to put, uh, you know, sort of safety messages in. Um, getting getting uh, information into the hands of of people who are not at a desk. You know, 20,000 of our employees are working in the field and are not sitting in front of a computer every day. How do you get to those folks and how do you keep them safe and how do you get them to be comfortable enough not to call in sick? So, you know, um, we, we did a lot of communicating about very detailed cleaning of things. Uh, we have train crews that live in uh, bunkhouses and hotels when they're on the road. How do you make them comfortable? How do you make sure two guys are, or people sitting in a a locomotive cab are, are okay to work in that kind of proximity. So a lot of communications and things that we, you know, you know, we've never done before, but uh, I'll say one thing, um, you know, my, my colleagues, and I'll say this for all CN employees, are, you know, really good at pulling together in a crisis. Um, you know, we've been faced with some pretty tough times over the years, and we drew on that. And that, I think, is what really uh, made the difference, is there was, there was nobody saying, no to each other. It was like, how can I help? You know, I understand this. You have this expertise. How we can bring it together and, and really put a plan in place. Things have calmed down a little bit, but um, you know, we're still uh, we're still communicating. We're still making sure that people know not to slack off on the you know the safety and hygiene front. But it has become you know the, the lack of routine has become routine. So. Well, you know, I when organizations are putting together issues management and crisis management plans, there are very few that put together a global pandemic crisis management plan. So it's uh, it's pretty impressive how you turn things around. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk broadly about the Canadian supply chain. Um, just and, and you can answer from broad or specific to CN, but what's been the largest impact of COVID on the Canadian supply chain? Yeah, I mean, I think the the abruptness of everything that stopped was was a real challenge. You know, some some uh, goods caught in transit, you know, having to uh, determine where they were, where they were going to go. That wasn't just a CN issue. That that was right across the supply chain. And you know, maybe a little silver lining of of COVID nineteen is that 
um, people are now understanding what supply chain means in a very personal way. So when you couldn't find hand sanitizer or face masks or you know alcohol wipes, it was because either the demand was out, outstripping supply or in, in the case of, of some of the, um, you know, the, the suppliers we were dealing with, those that manufacture alcohol and those that manufacture the pulp that goes into the, the wipes, um, you know, were fighting to be allowed to stay open to impress upon authorities that they were an essential service provider. So I think um, what is essential in today's world was getting defined on the fly, uh, making sure that uh, you know, the, the workers could get into those facilities to, to create those products. And then obviously uh, you know, the, the rail, the, all the truckers that have to, had to stay uh, working um, you know, and do it safely. So just a, a huge interconnectedness of a million little points of possible failure um, came to light. And, you know, in general, I, th I think the country's done really well. So whether it's CN or the ports or the trucks or the warehouses or, you know, all those secondary suppliers like uh, grocery stores and hotels that had to, had to stay open to make sure the essential uh, workers were, were fed and, and uh, had a place to put their head, um, all of that interconnectedness became very obvious. So as complicated as it, as it is, continues to be, um, I think it was a really good learning for, for Canadians on how reliant they are on all the different parts of Canada, all the different uh, manufacturers. And, and, you know, it's a little bit of a 101 on supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. What about the, uh, for, for the average person, we think about border closures and we think that is a border closure right now for, um, uh, let's think of it in terms of tourism for uh, for individuals crossing the border and that the flow of goods continues to happen. But I know that border closures both uh, within, between provinces and with Canada and the U.S. have had an impact on the demand for goods. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we, we deal with 60, well, we, we operate in 16 states and uh, eight provinces, nine provinces. Um, you know, we're reliant on those borders staying open. So the international border was one thing, but all those different jurisdictions that we had to deal with that, uh, you know, were closing and having, you know, conflicting, uh, conflicting messages. Um, New Brunswick closing its border to Quebec um, posed, posed difficulties for us. So again, it's, it's reaching out and um, speaking to all of those stakeholders and authorities that we deal with and you know, spending the time like this, explaining what we do, why it's important it be opened, um, and then being respectful of it. You know, uh, we were very clear with our employees, those that, that have to be out there for essential work. Um, you know, they got a letter from our, our uh, chief of police and corporate security uh, explaining why they were, you know, essential and allowed to travel. But if you, you took advantage of it and went to see your Aunt Bessie for a weekend and you got stopped at the border, you know, we weren't going to bail you out. So, you know, we were very respectful of, of you know, the, the limitations put on us. And um, we certainly didn't want to jeopardize that. Um, in terms of goods flowing back and forth, I think most jurisdictions have handled that quite well. Again, um, they learned from each other. There were best practices passed along. So that same sense of teamwork that we saw at CN, we saw it sort of in concentric circles, you know, outside of CN in terms of people working the supply chain, all of our partners and the authorities working with each other, the provinces were working with each other. There was actually a lot of good, um, you know, sort of collaborative effort um, to, 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 put, to put the limitations in place. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions online. So I'm gonna, for those watching, uh, I'm gonna get to those shortly. Uh, I got one more for you. Um, do you think uh, Canada's supply chain is ready uh, in the eventuality that we get a second wave of COVID? Yeah, I, I really hope we don't, but I, I would say yes. You know, we've had our we've had our trial run. We know how to do this. Uh, we are trying to reopen and we are talking recovery and, you know, bringing people back. Um, if that turns into a second wave and we all have to go home again, uh, we know how to do it. It will be a huge hit though. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I, I can't stress how important it is that every single Canadian takes responsibility for the health of the people around them, not just themselves, but around them. 
you know, you're wearing a face mask for the person beside you. Hopefully that person's wearing the face mask for you. We, we will, you know, we will be plunged into sort of a second, a second drop on my chart if we, uh, if we don't do this. So all those little green shoots that we're seeing and all that sort of fluttering activity of the economy coming back will be stopped out. And um, yeah, I think the supply chains can weather it, but I'm not sure if all the small businesses who are really uh, the ones that have been the hardest hit um, have a second wind in them. I mean, it, it, it will be devastating to some of them. And you know, for that reason alone, um, everyone on this call, I want you to wear your face mask. So let's, uh, let's make sure a second wave doesn't come back in that kind of, um, that kind of uh, level. Yeah, absolutely agree. You know what, that's, that's so well stated and so important. And uh, we've been working very hard behind the scenes to try and help people have the right advice about staying safe for themselves and their employees and their customers and, uh, and, and preparing for a potential second wave. And, and you're right, hopefully it doesn't come. Um, so, okay, uh, Margarita asked, wondering if there are any timelines on when the Milton Hub project may begin. May begin. Well, it's uh, shovel ready. So, you know, we're sort of sitting there with our shovel ready to go. Um, we are waiting for approval. Um, so, you know, it's uh, timeline is such that uh, we feel that we're going to get news in the, in the coming weeks. And uh, obviously we have our fingers crossed that it's positive. And once once it's uh, once it's a go, uh, if it's a go, uh, we'll be moving fairly fairly quickly to get that in place. Um, construction uh, season is coming to an end in 2020. I know that's we're middle of summer, but by October November, most construction projects start to wind down. So um, shovel in ground 2020 might be a bit uh, optimistic, but you know we got to get past this first uh, first step and. Um, you know, we're, we're confident that uh, once that's done, we'll we'll move into action fairly quickly. And we're hoping for some positive news. I appreciate that question. And um, so James wrote, what are some top industry goods other than PPE that businesses were not able to receive when China was in lockdown? Um, well, listen, there's, there's you know, obviously all the, the sort of discretionary non-essential goods that, that you know, were, uh, were impacted. But... Um, you know, there's any number of, uh, of sort of essential service, essential goods like groceries, um, you know, the, the flow of, uh, of, of materials into uh, manufacturing sites. So, you know, I can't sort of isolate one or, or, or you know, a specific commodity that, that went into real shortage, but I think it was the delays and it was the, the not knowing uh, if, your supplier or your source of that material was open and operating that caused a lot of issues. Um, you know, we, we were bringing um, PPE over the border um, and every, every container of PPE was being uh, uh, sort of investigated to make sure that it was actually okay to come into Canada. Um, you know, the Americans didn't want to run short. So there were, there were things like that where, you know, you kind of had to prove that you were sourcing this material from that supplier before the pandemic to be allowed to move it. So complications like that. Um, you know, I can tell you CN ourselves, we were running, uh, running out of, um, you know, san hand sanitizer, that type of thing. We bought carloads, tank cars of uh, isopropyl alcohol um, and big bales of, of cotton sheets and making our own wipes for about only about four or five weeks, we had three uh, stations all over the CN network where we had employees cutting up sheets and making our own wipes. So, you know, it got, it got down to, you know, fair, <laughs> fairly low. I hope you videotaped that. You should put that <laughs> we out. We did actually. I think, I think we, yeah, we did. But I mean, you, you're getting down to sort of low, low uh, quantities of things that you take for granted. Um, you know, so if you look at our data, you can see the toilet paper spike and then it drops. And then you can see the, you know, the, the chicken spike when people thought they weren't going to get enough chicken. And then, you know, so it's just, it's, it's going to be fascinating for some PhD student to go back and look at, at the pandemic and then see sort of the, the, the reaction in the supply chain, because it's, it has not just been a sort of steady stream. There's, there's things that, um, you know, we can see people got enough toilet paper, they stopped buying that and something else popped up. So really, really interesting to look at it. Definitely. Um, 
Is this an interesting question about global supply chain uh, and the movement for uh, for local production? Uh, so the question was, uh, how do you think CN will be impacted if there's a movement towards more local or deglobalized production? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's something on our minds, obviously. Um, it's I don't think we feel that it's the big threat that, that you know, it's being made out to be. Um, people trade. I mean, you go back millennia, people trade. And, um, you know, this is a trading nation. So for this idea that, you know, we can kind of cocoon ourselves away from the rest of, of, of the world and not uh, trade our natural resources uh, for their goods or, you know, bring in semi-finished goods and finish them off. Um, I just, I think it's human nature to, to, to want to expand outwards. Um, will there be sort of a, a protectionist uh, um, sort of wave, perhaps? Um, but you just have to look at NAFTA, the new USMCA, to see how deeply, deeply integrated uh, the North America economy is. And... Um, you know, can we can we close the borders to uh, global trade? I don't think so. I think there's there's going to be a natural tendency back towards that. Um, it's taken a hit, and you know there will be people who who cautiously come back. Um, but I think if you look at grain, and you know, people can buy grain from other countries. They can buy grain from countries closer to themselves. Um, you know, it's booming right now. Canada has a lot of what the rest of the world needs, and that's never going to change. Um, are we going to start uh, seeing new manufacturers pop up in Canada um, and that we buy goods made in Canada? Maybe. Like, that's not a bad thing. But, you know, this idea that, that it'll be all or nothing, I think, is, you know. Is, is yeah, we certainly agree. And, and this topic has come up. I wanted to thank uh, Sarah for that question. Yeah, good um, question. You know, you... you uh, you would have heard me say earlier too, like we've talked about the advocacy of the chambers done, and, and we're really looking now at sector specific support, uh, primarily at the federal government for sectors who have been disproportionately hurt that won't have a quick recovery. You think about uh, tourism, hospitality right away, especially because of how much there is in bond uh, and a lot of their goods coming through freight. Um, you think about the airlines, of course, uh, oil and gas. That's the one I want to focus on with you. So that was a big part of your um, uh, your movement. Uh, so when we saw a decrease in that, uh, was what big black? That was grain. Like how else has CN adapted to that new reality? Right. So, um, well, first of all, I'll say you know uh, we're a big supporter in uh, getting the airlines back back up and 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 moving and and all of that sector. Um, in fact, our CEO signed a, a letter uh, with the um, Canadian Business Council on that front and with Air Canada. Um, so to, to turn to your question, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a drop off in oil and gas because uh, demand, you know, was down, a lot, of, a lot of less driving, a lot of less diesel required. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a global market. Back to that idea that, you, you know, you're, you're part of a bigger supply chain. So there were other factors at play, too, in terms of uh, oil production in, in places other than Canada that, that have played a role. Um, the oil sands has been hard hit. Alberta has been hard hit. And when Alberta is hurting, Canada hurts. Uh, I think sometimes in the East, we, we, we don't always draw that conclusion. But, um, you know, whatever your beliefs are about oil and gas, it's good for the Canadian economy. So, you know, we hope that Alberta um, and that whole sector gets healthy again. I can tell you that the price of uh, Western Canadian Select is, is higher than it's been for a while. It's up above $30 a barrel or it was last week anyway, which is good news, that that's about at the price where um, things start to come out of the ground again and into rail cars and pipelines. Um, but it's, it's, it's gonna be very slow and it's gonna be tentative. And um, you know we welcome it back when it comes, um, but yeah, it's a sector that's been very, very hard hit. And I, I wanna check on, uh, just to be respectful of your time and the audience, are you okay to go for about 10 more minutes? That, uh, sure, Brian, if, yeah. if you want to keep me yeah. here, that'd be great. Yeah, it's, okay, no, well, we could go hours, actually. This is very interesting, <laughs> but we'll keep it to 10 minutes. Um, I wanted to ask, um, well, I'll ask you this one that came in uh, from the audience. Uh, 
when do you expect that CN service will return to pre-COVID levels? I, I think that's a difficult question. And as I said to the uh, Deputy Chief Economist, the TD, uh, maybe we need a psychic for some of this stuff. Uh, yeah. Nobody knows about a second wave, but but I'll ask the question, when do you think uh, it might yeah. return to pre-COVID levels? Well, you know, it, it depends. Is it going to be a, a U-shape, a V-shape, a swoosh, a W? Who knows? Right. Uh, an S? I don't know. <laughs> but, right. um, you know, we're, we're hoping uh, to see um, the consumer goods sector uh, pick up, you know, now, Q3. Um, this, this, this recovery will be led by the consumer. You know, we've got to get out of our houses and we've got to start buying again and, um, and do it safely. But... That, that is a, a big part of what needs to happen. So, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that's going to be the case. We're seeing some signs of, of recovery there. Uh, the automotive sector is back and actually has come back, you know, quicker and a and, um, little healthier than we thought it would. So that's a good sign. Um, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing parts of the manufacturing sector starting to, to percolate. Um, you know, that's probably going to take us through Q3, Q4. Um, we're kind of looking out beyond COVID already and, and planning for 2021. Um, you know, I think a good indication that CN sees things returning uh, in the you know, not too distant future is that we're continuing to invest uh, that 2.9 billion in, in, uh, in capital. Um, and we're, we're ready, we, we, you know, we, need, we need to hear from our customers and hear from these sectors about their timing so that we can start uh, recalling those, you know, 3,800 folks that we laid off and taking those locomotives out and, um, you know, dusting off the, the rail cars that have been sitting in storage. So there's going to be this sort of start, stop, start, stop. That's usually what happens. Um, there'll be some tensions around, you know, how fast we are responding and how sticky the recovery is on our customer's front. But, um, you know, don't uh, don't worry. We are absolutely motivated to to move every piece of traffic we can get our hands on, and um, you know be part of the really part of the recovery effort and 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 a, and a solution for it. Yeah, no doubt. Um, one question I want to ask you personally was, uh, and and it's a it's an interesting question to ask people is there have been a lot of negatives because of the pandemic, but there also have been some positives. So I'm wondering whether uh, you personally. Uh, have learned something about yourself or your team or about CN that's been positive uh, in light of the pandemic and you thought, well, I didn't know we could have done that or just a positive lesson? Yeah, great, great question. And, and I'm a sort of optimistic person. So I, I, I do see silver linings in things. And, um, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that has really uh, been heartwarming is that, um, that teamwork and people, when they ask you how you are, they actually care about the answer. You know, slowing down a little bit, taking time to, to connect with people. I think we found that again. Uh, I know I, I'm, I was one of those people sort of running around, chicken with my head cut off, uh, you know, overbooked, never, never enough time to finish anything. So I think there's been an opportunity to, to sort of, uh, although we're very busy and we're very productive, it's maybe to uh, enjoy some of the simpler things. Um, I, I can tell you, I... I've been working sort of from home and from the office. Uh, so I'm one of those people that have been in and out. Uh, I sure like getting up in the morning and going for a walk. Uh, I, you know, you don't have to spend uh, an hour on your hair and your makeup, which is kind of fun for, for, for people who do that. Um, you know, so there's been, but I also realize you need a routine. And I, I didn't realize I was as married to my routine as I was. So I, I, was, I found it challenging for the first few weeks. Um, I found it stressful. Um, leading a team online, you know, getting getting 40 people together every day and trying to keep the spirit up. And so um, I think it's it's been good for teams. I think it's been good for colleagues and probably good for families, spending a little more time together. I think I've seen my husband more in the last 15 weeks than I have in the last 15 years. So it's uh, <laughs> there's some there's some good good parts of this. That's great. Uh, technological advancements. Uh, I, this is a sincere compliment, uh, having toured many of your facilities. Uh, I haven't seen very many uh, operations that had the level of operational efficiency that CN does have. Are there um, technological advancements that can help uh, or that you need to further double down on given COVID to put you in a better standing moving forward? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're putting a lot of money into uh, technology that, that will... Um, remove uh, the human 
the human being from what potentially is an unsafe situation uh, or less safe, I guess I would say. So, you know, when we're doing uh, inspections of rail cars using uh, portals, so we, we drive our train at track speed through, uh, you know, a, basically a series of, of intelligent cameras and, and algorithms to tell us if that car uh, and that train has a car on it that's uh, in need of repair. Not only are we, you know, we're doing it infinitely faster. I think it's two minutes to do a whole train. It used to take two minutes to do a rail car. Um, so, you know, that, that use of technology to uh, enable our people to do their jobs better um, keeps them out of harm's way. And it also means that, you know, they're not out uh, side by side uh, working sort of hard labor where, where they would have been in the past. So those are, those are technologies that I think will, will give us that, that extra lift coming out of the, out of the crisis. Um, you know, same thing with our track inspection, uh, autonomous track inspection, uh, rail cars. So rail cars that we put in, they're high-tech cars, we put it in the train and it travels with our, our, our traditional traffic, but it, it's actually taking a photograph and, and a, you know, sort of um, a read of the quality of the track beneath it. Um, you know, that, that used to be done by people walking and driving the track and, you know, we'll still be doing those things, but we'll be augmenting it with this and maybe one day replacing it with this. So again, technologies that can, um, can, can take people out of harm's way and take them out of having to be in close proximity to each other and using the technology and then using those people um, for their expertise to fix the problem as opposed to find the problem. So I think that's those are the places that we uh, were focused on, and, and yes, we'll, we'll be doubling down on. Makes sense. Um, there was a question about what areas of manufacturing, in your opinion, what areas of manufacturing uh, might we begin to see produce more goods, producing more goods in Canada? Obviously, the uh, in the particular sector with uh, anything related to PPE, I think we're going to see more of that because that's a provincial directive now. Yeah. But are there other sectors or? You, you yeah, saying? I think, you know, I think um, we're going to have to wait and see how that that transpires. But I think there is sort of an opportunity for uh, burgeoning companies in Canada to be known. Um, you know, I think there's going to be sort of a movement towards, uh, you know, shop Canada, buy Canada, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So um, if there are manufacturers of, uh, you know, industrial goods or parts or all of that type of uh, um sort of smaller industrial uh, manufacturing. I think, I think that there's a good chance there. Um, again, Canada is one of these, one of these unusual countries that, you know, uh, we, we have the, the natural resources that people want for goods that we don't have the population to con consume all of them. So I still think we're going to be really heavily tied into, into uh, supplying others with the materials to make goods that we will eventually purchase back from them. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always good news when a Canadian company can, you know, build and, and, and create the goods that get consumed right in the country. And um, I guess that remains to be seen. If it's a resurgence for manufacturing, that's good news. Absolutely. Um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up shortly, but I wanted to give you uh, just, is there any enduring message you wanna leave with our audience? Uh, so I'll put it back to you and then I'll give some concluding remarks. Well, yeah, I just, I'd say, listen, um, you know, we've, we've been around for a hundred years where, uh, you know, we're a part of the fabric of Canada. We very much take uh, our responsibility as an essential service provider uh, very seriously. Uh, we know that we play an important role in the recovery for all of, you know, the businesses that are listening here today and all of our customers. And um, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're very determined to play our role and to do it safely and, and to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're timing things to come back and to help with the recovery where, where we can. And I would just say there's, there's a team of us out there. There's 25,000 of us. You probably know someone at CN. Um, reach out to us if we can help. Um, you know, we've, we've, in the last uh, 15 weeks, we've actually donated over a million dollars to small grassroots um, not-for-profits people that were having a hard time making rent or didn't have the, the money to, to keep their, their works going. Um, that's the kind of company we are. We, we like to hear from the people along our track side. So uh, I would leave that as my message is reach out to us where we're not just a, a big impenetrable company that we might seem uh, um, 
and there's there's uh, there's definitely a, you know a sort of welcome a welcome mat for anyone that wants to, to talk about recovery and how, how we can help. I think that's a great message, and, and I mean I mean no through the Vaughn Chamber we've always found CN to be a great partner and, and very open to uh, to any. Uh, uh, ways we want to work together. So we'll look forward to continuing to do that. And Fiona, I, I really want to thank you uh, for joining us today and, and being so candid with your answers. And and I said earlier, and it was quite honest, uh, like I'm a big uh, proponent of the uh, of CN, but also of uh, freight movement and supply chain and, and your whole sector. So I, I we could have done this for several hours, but I don't think our time allows. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Brian. Really enjoyed being here. And thank you to everyone who has been listening and great questions and uh, Again, thank you to your team, and um, I look forward to uh, opportunities to speak to you in the future. Me too. Thank you very much. And uh, and for those uh, those watching at home, just a reminder, because a lot of you have been asking about uh, PPE uh, equipment. Uh, you've all asked for different things, whether it's plexiglass or hand sanitizer, masks, uh, what have you. So there is a PPE supplier guide on our website on the homepage under the news section. Uh, it's all York Region businesses. I think there's about uh, 20 or so listed in the Vaughan community. So I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look. Uh, there's no guarantee they'll have all the products, but these are companies that we're uh, well aware of. And uh, if you're looking for those right now, give them a call. Um, you can always join the Vaughan Chambers mailing list. It's quite large. Uh, that's free to do. It's on our uh, homepage as well, how to do that. Keeps you up to date on what we're doing. Um, we'll be hosting uh, more online networking sessions uh, and recovery workshops soon. So you can watch out for that. I know those have been, uh, there's a lot of interest in that. People are saying actually, uh, one person recently said it's easier to network online than it is in person. Uh, I don't necessarily feel that way, but I think it's been a good experience and uh, and we can enjoy that. And, and we'll continue to do aspects of that even after COVID. Uh, so we'll, uh, you can look for that. And finally, we wanna thank all the sponsors through the Von Chain Group who've been so active with us. Uh, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, we'll be there together after. So I think, uh, Mike, on the on, on the version that you're seeing online, you're seeing our community banners. I uh, just want to give a shout out to all those businesses that uh, continue to support the Chamber and will continue to be there for you. And um, at this point, just to wish you all a good day and a safe weekend and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks very much. <laughs>